I'm Curtis Ramsey Lucas, Director of Marketing and Communications at the American Baptist Home Mission Societies and Editor of the Christian Citizen. I'm joined today by Tim Shriver, Founder and CEO of Unite. Welcome, Tim. Thanks for having me, Curtis. So you have long been involved with uh, the Special Olympics movement and also are the founder and CEO of Unite. What is Unite and when and why did you start it? Well, as you mentioned, Curtis, I've had the great privilege of being involved in the Special Olympics movement for most of my life, actually, since I was a child when my mother was experimenting with play and summer camp activities and sport with children who in, that, in those days in the 60s were coming from institutions. Um, so I've had this uh, extraordinary, uh, like to say, front row seat for the best in humanity, volunteers, coaches, sponsors, donors, uh, people without disabilities and people with disabilities, bringing out just the, the most beautiful and most joy filled and most potential laden parts of themselves, um, taking a chance on each other, taking a chance on themselves, uh, trusting in communities to, to be places of welcome. You know, it's just been unbelievable to watch the Special Olympics movement over the course of my life. You know, now close to 5 million people in almost 200 countries who are creating small Special Olympics events in all their neighborhoods and communities all over the world. So, you know, when I decided to step down from the day-to-day -day role uh, about six years ago, um, I thought to myself, my, the big question I had was, how can I share what I've learned from the athletes of Special Olympics in some other and in some other way, in some other context. And I looked around and, you know, what I saw in our country uh, was just the opposite. Cynicism, hostility, dehumanization, uh, lack of trust in each other. Um, uh, in, in the words of one of our social and emotional learning curriculums, you know, naysayers everywhere. Like, the, and, and when we teach kids this, the, you know, you have this little model of the horse inside you, the little naysayer. Uh, but the naysayers were, are, are, are kind of out of control. So I asked myself, uh, is that the real story of us? And it's, I, my, my, my conclusion was, no, that's not who we are. That's, that's actually a distortion of who we are, all that hostility. Uh, and this, this sort of unbridled contempt is the, is a problem. It, it's not that we differ, uh, that creates divisions. It's contempt and fear, uh, and hostility and dehumanization that create, uh, division. So, you know, if you think division is the problem, what's the opposite? <laughs> Unity. And so many prayers that I heard in the back of my conscience, you know, I heard all these prayers from liturgies about that they might be one and in union with, and so that the children would be one, so that you might, uh, you and I might be one. And I thought to myself, you know, that doesn't mean we all agree. Unity doesn't mean we all agree. Unity doesn't mean we're all the same. Unity means that at some level, we are bound together. Uh, in a creative force field, in a in an ultimate meaning making space, right? Where somehow we are in this together, and at some level, we know that, and that's what I've seen in Special Olympics. You, know, you can have an athlete with Down syndrome and a Nobel Prize winning professor, and and when you put them on the playing field together, they somehow see in each other. Uh, the same they see they see the parts themselves that are bound together and, and you don't have to explain it you just know it so i wanted to create an organization that brought people to this kind of almost sense of a spiritual coming together in the face of a spiritual crisis and try to come up with solutions that could invite us to to re-feel reconnect with that part of ourselves that's hungry uh for belonging and hungry for purpose and hungry to believe that we can all uh, somehow work together. So, you know, we've got a lot of little projects uh, that are trying to take on a huge problem. We've got our Dignity Index, which you've so graciously written about. We've got a podcast, which I'm launching called Need a Lift, which is just interviewing folks, I, 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 interviewing folks like you, Curtis, who uh, give people uh, the stories of the work of uh, the best of humanity and never giving in to hatred uh, and contempt and dehumanization, but taking them where they are, and they are out there. 
uh, and transforming them into something uh, beautiful. That's my hope. So you talked about uh, one of these projects, the, the Dignity Index, um, which is a scoring tool for political rhetoric. Walk us through how that works. What's the what's so the, the Dignity Index takes this uh, idea that contempt is the problem, not difference. Most people think, oh, the country's going down the tubes because we can't agree on the border or we can't agree on education or we can't agree on guns or something like that. The dignity index is trying to say, mm -hmm. if we have a problem, it's not that we don't agree. It's that we treat each other with contempt when we disagree. So people said, well, that's all nice, but how do you know if you're treating someone with contempt or how do you know if you're treating somebody with... So we built a scale that shows you on a scale of one to eight, where you are when you say to your friend at work, uh, you're wrong about, let's say, gun rights. Um, uh, and when you say that, you know, you're wrong about it and you're a real danger to the country, we can score that. Because that's a score uh, that carries quite a lot of contempt in it. It's either a three on our scale or maybe even a two, it depends on the context. If I say, on the other hand, I don't agree with you on gun rights, um, but I value your story and I know you have opinions too, I would give that something like uh, a five or even maybe a six on the scale because that suggests a sense of, of respect for your opinion. It doesn't mean I agree with your opinion. So the Dignity Index is a scoring tool. You could score Donald Trump or Kamala Harris, but you can also score yourself. Or you could score your spouse. You could score your teacher. You could score your best friend who posted something on social media last week. Uh, and by scoring, it's not that you weaponize the idea that, see, I caught you, Curtis, I found you in contempt. What, it, what the index does is it almost intuitively reveals to you that you could actually use more dignity if you wanted to. You don't have to sacrifice your principles to make a point. You just have to add a principle, which is when I disagree with you, Curtis, I will never violate your dignity. Uh, and that opens up for people. Oh my God. Well, how would I do that? How do I, when I really disagree, I don't have to, Oh yeah, that's a good point. And for, particularly I would say for people of faith, uh, this concept that I should, that I can, that it's easy to treat people with dignity, even in the face of significant and passionate disagreement, it's kind of almost liberating because I think people find in their faith this message, love your enemies, we are one, we're all hungry for the same things. God has been so gracious and generous and kind and merciful to all of us. We know that, but then we don't feel it when we're in a conversation or when we're in a debate. So the Dignity Index kind of helps us hold both of these, how to disagree, but how to do it while still preserving and ele even elevating the dignity of, of others. So you piloted this uh, program in Utah during the congressional elections in 2022. What are some of the key findings that came out of that pilot project? Well, the first was uh, that the instrument itself works. Hmm. We've, you know, in the terms of the social science, we've normed and validated it so that we, we, we're confident that in multiple uses, it tells us the same thing. And we're also confident that even if different people use it, they will come up with the same score. So those are the social scientists came at this and we had to, you know, mess around with it a little bit at different times to get it right. Uh, but once we got it right, we, we, we have high confidence in the inter-rater reliability and in the validity of the instrument. So it's objective. That means like if I scored Donald Trump and a passionate Trump supporter scored Donald Trump, we'd score it the same if we're, if we're using the instrument properly. Or if I score Kamala Harris and a passionate Kamala Harris, we'd score the, her the same because the, the instrument actually tells an objective score. That's the first thing we found out. Second thing we found out was journalists really like it. They were excited by, well, Mike Lee scored a this, or Evan McMullen, those were the Senate candidates, scored higher than Mike Lee, or Mike Lee scored higher than Evan McMullen, or what do you think of that? So we, we it ended up triggering the conversation about dignity and contempt in the local media markets uh, throughout Utah. The third thing, and maybe the most exciting thing we found was what we call the mirror effect. The people we trained to score, to do the scoring, 
became less and less interested in scoring other people and more and more interested in using the dignity index to change themselves. And that was an aha for us. That was like, whoa, we didn't see that coming. We thought, oh, you know, if we can prove that Kamala Harris is worse or better than Donald Trump or the other way around, then we'll make them more effective politically or challenge them to do better politically. Actually, what people are actually interested in is how they can bring more dignity to their own lives as much as they want to know how they can use it as a tool to judge other people. So that's opened up for us a whole horizon of work. Schools now want to use the dignity index so kids can learn not how to judge other kids, but how they can get better at how to disagree. College campuses want to use it so they can teach kids how to challenge their professors and how to engage in debate in classes and even how to protest if they want to protest, but to do so with dignity. And uh, corporations are at, well, wow, we can use this for team building and for improving, you know, our onboarding processes and building our corporate culture around dignity so that there's not all this tension and fear around political issues and so on. So it's it's gotten a kind of a life of its own based on that uh, that big insight that the index creates the mirror effect. I'd encourage uh, anyone listening, go to dignityindex.us and just play with it for five minutes. You, you don't have to, it's not a, you don't have to spend like two hours. I mean, you can spend two hours there, but you don't have to. You can get it quite quickly. Um, and it's it's quite a lot of, honestly, it's quite a lot of fun. That's That's one of the, that's one of the nice outcomes here. So you wrote a column in uh, early August celebrating the fact that uh, both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris were talking about unity. You wrote, and I quote, if given a choice, a large swath of Americans will vote for the person who offers a credible and serious effort to unite us. Both candidates have said the same thing. The one who really means it and acts on it will win. Now, that was prior to the presidential debate. Do you still believe that today? And do you see either candidate making a serious effort to bring Americans together? Well, I absolutely believe it. In fact, I believe it more than when I wrote it. The data, particularly now, just looking at this from a pure political perspective, uh, as we're hearing over and over again, what matters in this election is swing voters in uh, purple states. So there's a handful of states, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and so on, Georgia, North Carolina, maybe even. Um, uh, there's a handful of states that are up for grabs. And in those states, there are voters who are undecided. Here's what we know about those voters. Uh, they're part of the exhausted majority. The exhausted majority are Americans who are turned off by contempt, who believe we have more in common, uh, than the politicians tell us and who want real solutions. That's the definition of a dignity voter. People who believe we have more in common no longer want to be swallowed up by contempt and want real solutions to problems. Um, they don't necessarily agree on all the issues, but they agree on those things. So the more we look at those swing voters in those states, what they're waiting for is the candidate who will signal to them that they will dial down the dehumanization of their opponents, that they will increase an emphasis on common values and common commitments, and that they will be practical about bringing people together to solve problems. I have no doubt that as swing voters go to the polls in November, the person who in their minds has answered those questions affirmatively will be the person they vote for. And I don't think it will be driven by party affiliation. I don't think it'll be driven by how much snark you can put on your social media how many zingers you get in a debate, how you know your photo ops look, or uh, those kinds of things. I think it'll be driven by the almost the like the the bat signal. I'm going to send the signal that I'm going to tone down the contempt by listening to my voters who don't agree with me. I'm going to bring out the common values and I'm going to solve problems. The person who does that wins. So you're working with a bipartisan panel of individuals who've been trained in how to use the Dignity Index. Um, they watched and scored the presidential debate um, between Donald Trump and Kamala Harris. How did the candidates do? What What did you see in terms of their... I mean, so what we score is the language that the candidates use when they address each other. Hmm. Because we're primarily interested in how we treat each other. 
not your soaring rhetoric about the future. Oh, the, America's going to be this, or America's going to be that, or America should be this, or America should be that, or America isn't this, or America isn't that. We don't measure any of that. Hmm. We measure when Vice President Harris turns to President Trump and says, you are an X, Y, Z, or when President Trump turns to Vice President and says, you are an X, Y, Z. Uh, on those portions of the debate where they addressed each other, they both, I'm sorry to say, scored at the low end of the scale in the three and even the two range. Uh, there were a few sections where they scored in what we would call the five range, where they were where they where they expressed a sort of uh, equanimity about equal time and uh, a balanced approach to the other. Uh, so when Vice President Harris spoke about the Middle East conflict, she expressed a sort of a all sides need to be heard uh, a, 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 a approach. Uh, when President Trump spoke about um, some of the attacks Vice President Harris was making about him and the sales tax, he just spoke factually. He didn't he didn't call her a name. He just said the, that's not accurate. Mm -hmm. that, that would be like a five. In, in the he didn't say he loved her or anything like that or he valued her humanity but he didn't say he didn't call her name so those would be like fives so we have a few fives but for the most part uh if a swing voter was tuning in and wishing they could hear either one of those candidates turn to the other and say you know on election day i know that there'll be 75 million americans who aren't going to vote for me and I want to address them and you and let you know that every one of them will be important to me uh, if I'm elected. And every one of them uh, has interests and concerns that I want to understand more deeply. And if and when I become president, if, President Trump or Vice President, I promise you that I will treat every one of your voters uh, with as much dignity as I treat my own. Now, we didn't hear that, but that kind of message, I think uh would sweep uh swing voters into the camp of whoever said it and you know of course they'd want to know if it's true and they'd want to make it make sure it's believable uh and you know politicians are often accused of being inauthentic but if you could convince them that you actually meant it i think you'd win so the united states faces a host of um, problems challenges national security the economy border security uh immigration yet you've said that contempt is the biggest single problem we face right now can you say more about that well the, here's the here's the here's the issue we can't solve any of those other problems if we insist on demonizing half and dehumanizing half the country hmm. all of the biggest problems require a coordinated effort and what this country has done well when it's been at its best has marshaled a collective effort across party, across state, across ethnicity in pursuit of a common goal. Um, and when we've done that, even when we've had to oppose forces within the country, we have shined, we have been a beacon to the world. We can't do that if we're dehumanizing each other. We can't support a resolution of national security interests in Eastern Europe or in the Middle East or in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Asia in the South China Sea, we can't be effective if people who both are friend and foe of us don't believe they can trust us, don't believe we can act, don't believe we're unified, don't believe we have the power of uh, common purpose. And the same thing is true at home. Whatever your belief is on climate change or on the border or on taxes, I mean, all these things on guns, they all require a broad consensus to solve. And you can't produce a consensus if the culture promotes contempt for people on the other side of a, of a, of a position. So our, our premise isn't that our issue is like, oh, we have the most important issue. Our premise is that our culture is making it impossible to solve our issues. So we have to address the culture and the problem in the culture is quite singular. The problem in the culture is not differences of opinion. It's dehumanizing contempt for people with whom we differ. Do you see this as um, primarily a concern for our national politics or is this rise in contempt and lack of dignity increasingly becoming an issue at the state and local level as well? 
I mean, the hardest part of exploring this question is seeing the toll that contempt takes on our personal and uh, social lives. Hmm. Almost 100 million Americans have ended a relationship with someone they are either related to or, or are close to over politics. Uh, almost half of our teenagers report feeling despair about themselves and about the future. Uh, majorities of Americans no longer believe that we can solve problems. Uh, uh, we are grieving, maybe in the wake of COVID, maybe in the wake of other problems. We are grieving, but as one spiritual teacher of mine said, the, the most painful grief is the loss of hope. Contempt saps us of hope. Uh, and so I think that, um, unfortunately, when we see dehumanization on cable news, or we see it on social media, or we hear it from our political leaders, it eats us from the inside out. It's not just about who scored a point in a political debate. It's actually making us sick as human beings. It's making us heartbroken. It's making us afraid. It's making us lonely. It's making us uh, hostile to each other. And people don't, uh, you know, we don't flourish as a species uh, when we're hostile and when we're embattled and when we're uh, besieged by others. We, we, we depend on love, I dare say. And uh, this is killing. This is making it hard for us to to have confidence in each other. And and that's where the the big the most, you know, like I say to politicians, oh well, don't you know, contempt wins. But I'm like, at what cost? Hmm. Uh, are you okay with being part of the reason that forty eight percent of American teenagers are near depression? Are you okay with that? Because I'm not. I mean, I was born and raised in a political family with strong political beliefs. I'm not willing for any of those beliefs to spin a story that puts millions of American teenagers into despair. It's not worth it to me. Not worth it. I think that the cost is too high. And if that's what it takes for me to get elected to the Congress or the Senate or the mayor's office or the first select member, I'm not going to, I don't want to do it. And I don't, I don't, I think we have to see it in those terms. We have to see how uh, brutal uh, the effect of uh, our leaders using contempt is on our personal lives. So you've talked about hope, love. Um, those all connect with faith. Um, what role do you see for religious leaders in this? Um, how can people of faith more broadly get involved in the work of Unite and the Duke? Well, I think the first thing is just to realize we can bring our faith uh, to our political convictions. We don't need, you know, I, I like to say to people, if you get a fundraising email from someone you love, let's just say you love such and such a candidate, and they send you a fundraising email that says, would you give 25 bucks and because my opponent is the devil? Write them back. Tell them you love what they do and you love and you want to vote for them, but you will not give to an email that dehumanizes other Americans. That's what a person of faith could do. Stand up for the idea that we're invited as people of faith to love our enemies. Uh, if, if that's our tradition, that we're invited as people of faith to see that God is, is all, ever merciful, if that's in our tradition, that we're invited to be agents uh, uh, of God's will here on earth, if that's your tradition, uh, and that the, the holy names of God include reference to the God of mercy, all merciful. Uh, so we can be people of faith and still believe, hey, I really want this person to win, but no, I, I will not support you uh, if you violate the most fundamental principles of my faith tradition, which is we are, I believe in you because I think you will help us come closer to the God of love, but I'm, you're not going to get us there by treating other people with hatred and contempt. So these are small actions that I think can shift the way we see our faith. Sometimes we, we see our faith just in terms of the principle. I'm pro-life or I'm pro-choice or I'm pro-immigrant or I'm anti-immigrant. My faith teaches me these things. I'm pro-gun or I'm anti-gun because of my faith. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm not against any of that. Hold on to your principles on all those things, 
even if they're all in disagreement with mine. But there's another principle of our faith, which we share, which is that we love one another. That's how you, that's theoretically how people will know you're a follower in the Christian tradition of Jesus. They will know you're a follower because you love one another. So you may love me even if I disagree with you. And that's a calling of your faith and a calling of mine too. In an article um, about your participation in the Disagree Better Summit in Oklahoma City in August, um, which we republished um, in the Christian Citizen in September, you wrote about, and you've spoken today about this, um, about the times we are living in being a, a, a spiritual crisis. What did you take from that event specifically, um, which was held at the memorial site of the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing? Well, you know, first of all, I'd recommend, uh, you know, Americans, uh, we hear, well, you got to get to the Grand Canyon, you got to get to Yosemite, Niagara Falls, there's so many beautiful sites, the, uh, the mountain ranges of the West and the East and the oceanfront, beautiful sites in New England and Florida and so on, California and the Pacific Northwest, go to Oklahoma City, put it on your bucket list, visit the site. Mm. Uh Learn about the people whose lives were taken in an instant of terror from their fellow Americans. Uh, learn about who they are and who they could have been. Uh, and at least for me, it was just a, a stark reminder. The beauty of the site is, is quite extraordinary. And the images of the little children who were so tragically, I mean, still emotional. You know, three and four and five year olds. Uh, uh, it just reminds me. I just, I, you know, for my, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a question. I guess we've been asking since the first words of the Bible were written. Why do we resort to violence? I mean, there's there's got to be better ways to solve problems. Um, and in this day and age, when our rhetoric is so casually, almost indifferently violent. Uh, wake, we, we, it just felt like a wake-up call to me. Maybe that's the best way to put it, uh, Curtis. It just felt like looking at the faces of those children and seeing the survivor tree and hearing the stories of the heroes who tried to help and save people. I just thought to myself, you know, uh, we can't excuse people who make it more likely that these kind of incidences we can't we can't allow ourselves to be guilty of making it more likely that these kind of incidents will happen we've got to change the way we address each other because when we speak uh, about our fellow americans as being subhuman or evil some people will hear that as a call to violence mm -hmm. and uh and it will be random and it will be brutal and it will be uh irreversible uh and it's not worth it no political race is worth it and no political issue is worth the taking of those innocent lives you mentioned the um corrosive effect of contempt on families on friendships um you talked about your own family you've uh your family's long been prominent in american politics and public service how has what you've learned through all of this shaped your interactions and relationships with members of your own family? Well, you know, we have um, we have a little skill toolkit for how to elevate the way in which you address others when you disagree. It includes things like be curious, not furious, mm. uh, regulate, then debate, listen to hear not to respond. This is an important one. Challenge ideas, don't attack people. I have used all of those skills with my siblings, my cousins, my children to try to manage uh, the level of uh, disappointment and anger and fear that political divisions have caused in my family. I'm not going to tell you I'm great at it because I'm not. And I don't think any of us are because this is not this is not a skill I practiced as a kid. 
And it's not a skill I've honed over 20 or 30 years, but it's these are skills I'm really working hard at. How do I listen to those on the other side of these issues within my own family to try to understand more deeply rather than just a counterattack? How do I get in touch with my core? Like, how do I regulate myself uh, so that I can see, try to see a little bit more clearly the goodness in my other family members who are saying things that otherwise might uh, trigger me. Uh, doesn't mean I agree with them. Um, in this case, I don't agree with uh, several members of my family. I don't agree with them at all. Uh, I think their their policies and the outcomes of their policies are very misguided. Very, 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 very misguided. But I'm trying really hard not to say they're jerks or they're idiots or they're stupid or they've uh, they're sold out or, you know, all these ad hominem attacks. That doesn't help. So I'm working at it. I'm a work in progress. And I, I'm encouraging other members of my family to try to use the same skills on both sides of these debates. It's very painful, though. Yeah. Unimaginable to me, even six or eight months ago. Um but we're just one example. We're not exceptional in this regard. Unfortunately, like I said, it's 100 million Americans who won't have Thanksgiving dinner this year with some member of their family because they can't stand them anymore. Yeah. So you didn't begin this work uh, in preparation for a single election. Um, as That's you look sure. beyond the election, what's next for the uh, Dignity Index? Oh, we're, we're trying to build, you know, uh, one of the, I'm, I'm so grateful to you, Curtis, is we're trying to amplify this conversation in many, many communities. Get get in the game. Help us figure out how to do this. I'm starting a podcast called Need a Lift. Uh, uh, starts uh, uh, next week, the week of September 30th, uh, because I want to elevate the voices of people who are transforming conflict into purpose and into new and more creative solutions to problems. And there are a lot of, there's tens of millions of Americans doing that. I call it, you know, need a lift because I think we all need one. I know I need a lift. So these are all people who give us a lift, who remind us we can do this. Don't give up, take a chance on each other. That's that's the message of need a lift. So we're gonna build uh, other sort of storytelling tools that invite storytellers to come in and tell these stories. I had the great uh, privilege to talk to Steve Hartman of CBS News about you know, his lifetime of telling stories that uplift people. Hmm. Uh, and he said, look, I said, what's the lesson? He said, people are good. People are good. He said, that's the only lesson I've learned in 30 years at CBS. Uh, so, you know, if you want to become a journalist, listen to Steve Hartman describe how he tells those stories and how he gets them placed on the CBS morning news and on the CBS evening news and how they get huge audiences. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, I'll talk to Michael Phelps. I'm talking to Rain Wilson, the comedian, uh, whose deep, deep faith is like, we've got to remind ourselves that we, we, as a people, faith will enable us, will empower us to be able to transform these conflicts. So everybody on the pot. So the answer to your question is we're trying to build a bigger and bigger conversation. We're tiny. We don't need to control it. We don't need to own it, lead it or anything. We just want to join it. And we want other people to join us. Let's have a conversation about how we can build the movement for dignity in our country um, that uh, gives us a chance to believe in us again. Any final thoughts for our readers and listeners? I, look, I just, uh, I just want to say with so much respect, uh, uh, I don't come from your faith tradition, but I have so much respect for the ways in which uh, the Baptist communities of all different sorts and sizes around this country have deepened a sense of service in the communities in which they operate, have reminded people of the sacredness of life over generations and generations, have brought people back to biblical wisdom over and over again. All these gifts are needed now. I don't care whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. I really, honestly, deeply do not care. But I do care that we all find uh, a pathway to bring the richness of your tradition back into the American conversation, not to make people Baptists or Catholics or Jews or Protestants, whatever it is, but to make us all better Americans. And uh, that's my hope. Well, thank you. I want to thank you for taking the time to uh, be with us today and to share your hope and vision for uh, Unite and for this country. Appreciate it. Thank you, Curtis.